I invite you to imagine a future in which there has been a war and America is lost. And the Statue of Liberty has been melted down for scrap. Most of the population has been decimated and those that have been survived have been forcibly deported to another nation. In such a horrible dystopic future, would America still exist? There'd be no public schools to teach American history. Right? It would have been reduced to something like the Ottoman Empire. Y'all know there was a, such a thing as the Ottoman Empire? Can you tell me anything about it? Exactly. It's just a blurb in history, right? <clears throat> would America still exist? No flags flying? No singing of the national anthem before sports game in the games that we play? Well, no more NFL, right? It's a hard thing to imagine. But this is the type of thing, this is the type of situation that the Jewish people found themselves in in the year 587 BC. Right? They faced this dire of a situation. You see, the kingdom of Israel, God's chosen people, had, had been in doing well for quite a while, right? They, had, they were God's chosen people living in the promised land, and they had split. The 12 tribes of Israel had split into the north and the south, the 10 tribes of the north, the two tribes of the south, Israel and Judah, right? And, and Israel had fallen. Assyria, the Assyrian Empire had invaded from the northeast. They'd come on down, and, and they had taken over the, the northern kingdom, the 10 tribes, and, and they, had, uh, they had brought in their own people, and, and taken over the government and, and brought in their own people to farm the land so that after two or three generations, the Jews and the Assyrians had interbred and intermingled and the ten tribes just faded and were gone. Right? And so the southern two tribes, the, the kingdom of Judah, they had watched this and they knew what could happen, but they, they were doing okay, right? They have the Davidic king, they've got the temple, they've got Jerusalem, and Jerusalem's got some good walls. Jeremiah comes along and tells them, do not assume that just because you've got the Davidic king in the temple that it's all always going to be good. They are warned, turn, or else. They do not turn, and so they, they experience the or else. The, the Babylon, the, as after the kingdom of Assyria, the empire of Assyria f fell to the empire of Babylon, and Babylon comes in again from the northeast, and it, and it tears down the walls of Jerusalem strips the temple, deports the people, the government is gone, the king, the no, there is no more Davidic king, the people were hauled off into exile. And, and there's this moment in 587 when the Jewish people have to ask, does Israel still exist? No king, no land, no temple. Do we still exist? What are we? What do we hold on to? What makes us Jewish if we have lost so much? In that moment, they start writing. They start writing as if their lives depend upon it, and, and they do, right? Their lives depend upon what they write. They write what we now know as the Old Testament. The Old Testament is written by the Jewish people when they have been deported and they have lost everything except for their stories of who they are. Right? So they start writing this down. Because if they don't write it down, there's no one who's going to teach their children to Sabbath. Right? If they'd sent their children off to the public schools of the day, what they, what they would have been taught about how the world was created. Here is the Babylonian understanding of how creation happened. Right? There was a, a goddess. And in a war, this goddess was split in half. And one half was pushed up and formed the sky. And the other half was pushed down to form the earth. And the blood that dripped down mixed with the dirt. And those, that blood formed the first savage humans. Right? You want to send your kids off to school to learn that? Right? So if anyone's going to teach their children, this is what it means to be Jewish. This is who you are. They're going to have to do it themselves. And so they start writing. They start writing and writing and writing because they knew if they did not, they would cease to exist. They start this writing. They began with, in the beginning. Right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This sort of peaceful statement. But then, hear the tension in the next verse, right? The Spirit of God was moving across the deep, the dark, the undercurrents, right? 
Knowing what position the people were in, what threat they were in, hearing that God was moving on the midst of the deep, the dark, the, the undercurrents that would pull you under, that has a little bit more poignancy, doesn't it? Right? Because they as a people, they were afraid they were about to get pulled under. They were afraid for themselves and to say that God in the beginning created out of the terrible formless and void is to say that God can still act even when we are in the middle of this dark, horrible, formless, and void uh, darkness, deep, right? It got, we can trust God now because God has already acted in such situations, right? So what is it that they write in the beginning? Is this the beginning of a science textbook meant to describe God's techniques? No. If you're looking for hard science, this is not the place to look. Because science is focused on creation. It is focused on, on, on all that God made. And Genesis is focused on something far bigger. It's not going to look just at creation. It's going to look at God and creation. And so in the same way that it's not science, it's also not a myth. That, that's, what, uh, that's the other temptation. We either want to take Genesis and reduce it to science and history and just the facts, ma'am, or, or we want to take it and make it a myth, somehow detached, right? You think about the myths that you know. You all know the uh, Greek pantheon, right? Zeus and Ares and Hera. And there was a pantheon of the, uh, of the Babylonian gods too, Marduk and Tiamat and Apsu and others' names that I, I cannot pronounce, right? And, but the thing about myths is myths are all about the gods. It is entirely focused on the gods. If you read the Greek mythology, it's all about Zeus fighting with Hera and fighting amongst the gods. And so that's not what they write either. They're neither focusing entirely on creation, science and history and all that focus. Neither is Genesis looking at the god alone. Right? No, this is something different. The Jewish people write down this story, the story that has been passed down to them from generation to generation. Right? This is a gift that they have. They write down this story that captures the, the truth they've experienced of a creator who creates creation. Right? The three words are intertwined. A creator without creation, it doesn't make sense. Right? And creation tell, tells you that there was a creator involved. So creator and creation tied together. That's what Genesis is looking at. It looks at creator and, and creation. And, and th this is the story the Jewish people have that have been passed down to them. And it's a story that they know to be true because they have experienced the creator creating the story of them. Right? This creator had called them out of slavery, called them into the wilderness, given them the law, given them the promised land, and had given them the kings, and had made them a people when there once was no people. Right? So the Jewish people start writing this story of creator and creation, of how there was a creation, and then there were the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and of slavery, and of the wilderness, of the kings, of the prophets. They start writing this story. And, and as they write this, this story, the best thing I can compare it to is this poetry. Right? This right here at the beginning, Genesis, it's not a history textbook. It's not a myth uh, that we push back into ancient times and ignore. It's, it's poetry. It's telling us something profoundly true in language that is lean and sparse and loaded. Right? I asked people on Facebook, share with me the poem that has told you something true. And, and some of you chimed in, and thank you. I, I read every single poem that was recommended, and um, as a reminded something important about poetry. Can you read poetry fast? No. If you sit down and read poetry with a timeline, you're, you're not actually reading it. You've got to sit down with poetry with a cup of coffee and give it the time it's going to take. Right? Poetry has meaning baked into every single word because every single word is perfectly chosen. Right? Just like the Jewish people, they're writing as their lives depend upon it and they want their children to know and they're choosing every single word carefully to tell this story of the God who has been their God and how they've been God's people. And so if we're going to read Genesis, we need to read this, especially this first, these first, first uh, chapters. We have to read it slowly. Oh, well, we might as well not read it at all. Like, that's why I realized 
I was traveling on Monday, and so then Tuesday did family work, and then Fletcher threw up nine times in a row on Wednesday. And, and I, I, I'm thinking, I have got to write this sermon, right? Tom, Sunday's coming, and I kept on reading through Genesis because I have to figure this out fast. <laughs> and until I, I had to tell Olivia, I'm going to go downstairs, and I'm just going to read until I find it, until it's there. And it's going to take me hours. And until I took hours and gave it the time that poetry demands, now I've got a sermon. Thank God. <laughs> but it takes time. Right? And so we come to this poetry, and what does, if you take the time to let it speak to you, what does it say? Right? What do we hear? We hear that God speaks. Right? God speaks. And when when God speaks, it's not the imperative. It's not that God demands that something exist. God teases, invites. Let there be. Right? When God invites this, it's that the, out of the wilderness, God brings something forth. And the fact that God speaks to creation, think about what you speak to. Right? Do you speak to your hammer? Right? Do you have long conversations with, with your tools? Right? Sometimes you swear at him. I'm not sure that counts as speaking. Right? You speak to partners. You speak to people that are, you're in relationship with. And so God speaks to creation, and creation is a partner with God. God rests in this. Right? Isn't that an amazing thing to say that God rests? As God is creating, then God takes time to rest. Did God need to rest? No. So what does it mean to say that God rests? What does it take for you to be able to close your eyes at night? If you're worried that you left a burner on, can you close your eyes? If you're worried about your son's about to throw up for the 11th time, can you close your eyes? If you're worried about a child who's out at night, can you close your eyes? To be able to close your eyes, you have to be able to trust that it's going to be okay until you open them again. Right? Rest is a sign of trust. God doesn't rest because God needed to. God rested because God trusted that creation that was good is going to be okay. Isn't it an amazing thing to be on the receiving end of that much trust? God trusts you enough to take a day off. It's a beautiful thing. It's peaceful. This, this, this whole passage, it's just peaceful. And, and the idea that God creates, if you look at the way that the days are described. How do we count days? Right? What, when does the day begin? Midnight. Right? We count days from midnight to midnight. Is that what it says in the text? There was an evening and there was a morning, the fourth day. In the Jewish culture, they count days. Sun, a day doesn't start at midnight. A day starts at sunset. And so at sunset, at sundown, that's when the day begins. So day is all of the night, and then all of the day, and then it was a day. And so this idea, if you think about how this unfolds, that the day begins and then God starts creating. God goes into the night, into the darkness, into this remnant of the formless and void that was in the beginning, all the deep swirling, that God goes into this remnant of the, of the deep and calls forth things. And, and then as the sun rises, there is something new. And then God gets to play with his new toys all day. And then finally at the end of the day says, yeah, that's good. And it was the fifth day. Right? That rhythm of going into the darkness and knowing that in the darkness, God can create something new. Beautiful. Right? There are many questions that we can ask about this, that, that fat, this piece of poetry. We could sit down and chew on this at great length. Right? Ask many questions. There are questions we can ask of it that it doesn't care about. Like, one of the questions I hear most about Genesis 1 is, how long was a day? It doesn't care. Genesis 1 does not care how long a day is. This is God creating. This is not... Stop worrying about the minutes. This is the beauty of creation. This is poetry. Stop worrying about that detail, right? It doesn't make sense. But another question I've been asked, like, where was God before the beginning? In the beginning, God created. Where was God before? Genesis doesn't care, because this is a story of God and God's people, God and, and God's creation, creator and creation. Genesis doesn't care about a creator before creation, because that's what it's focused on, that, that connection of God and God's people. 
There are questions that we can ask that we could bring to this and ask, like, dominion. What does it mean to have dominion about over all the earth if we're made in the image of God? How do we exercise the power we've been given? What does that look like? If there was light before there was sun and the moon, light was on day one, sun and moon is on day four, I believe. What does it mean to have light if you can have light without the sun? We are, we are bidden to be fruitful and multiply. Right? How does our fruitfulness and multiplication reflect what we're seeing in this story here? If God doesn't need to rest but rests anyways, how is how God practices Sabbath different than how we practice Sabbath when we really do need to rest? Right? These are the questions we can ask of it because it's poetry and it's concerned with God and God's people. We read it slowly and we can explore it together. Most of all, what I think we get out of reading Genesis is this sense of hearing again, that sense of if the world is crashing in, right? if the formless and the darkness and the void is pressing in, if life is unstable, if the world is unpredictable, if the future seems off as off as it was for the Jews struggling in 587 BC, we can read again and know that the creator who created creation is still active. We can read as if our life depends upon it and know that God's plan, which will come to fruition, is for peace. And we can rest knowing that God continues to create and redeem and sustain. Thanks be to God. Amen.